you know, to what degree is 201 impacting that information flow and what kind of information is it impacting? Hi, once again, everybody. Welcome back to the Comstock Channel. I'm Marlon Bowling with you. Always a pleasure to visit with you about ag-related issues, ag markets, you name it, anything ag-related. Today, I have Danita Murray with me, and uh, she is the executive uh, director of the South Dakota Corn Growers Association. And we're going to talk about a very important issue that's actually coming up. I mean, we've been talking for quite a while, of course, about the election cycle coming up. So it's not just about politicians. There's an important issue that's going to be decided in South Dakota. Uh, Danita, I understand it's called or labeled RL21. Now, for the benefit of our viewers, can you describe what that is and why that is such an important issue? Can you define that? Absolutely. RL21 is the kind of referred law number that was assigned by the Secretary of State here in South Dakota to the actual law that's being referred, which is Senate Bill 201, passed by our legislature in Pure South Dakota uh, this past session that really did a number of, of important things, including profit sharing and laid out some, some requirements for the CO2 pipeline company that's interested in crossing South Dakota. That, that In a nutshell, that's really what the referred law is about. A, a thumbs up vote or a yes vote means, yes, we like this law and we're going to keep it and, and have it be implemented on um, at the end, a, a no vote means, no, we, we aren't interested, and so we're going to vote down this referred law. So what would this law change from what has been the existing law? That's a great question, and I think that there's been some myths and a little misinformation about what this law changes. Uh, first, I'd I just like to point out that Senate Bill 201 has nothing to do here in South Dakota with the legal authority for eminent domain, and I think that the opponents to uh, the, the CO2 pipeline here in South Dakota were actually very smart. Uh, they tied these two things together. And, but uh, the reality is that, you know, Senate Bill 201 didn't affect the authority, the legal authority in the code or the court's ability to look at, at eminent domain and its use. So there's been a little confusion. And so I wanted to clear that up, that up first. Uh, other things, though, that Senate Bill 201 does, and I don't have a laundry list in front of me, but I note, again, I mentioned profit sharing. You know, the the Inflation Reduction Act came through uh, in, a, in a very, very significant way a few, a few years ago with federal tax credits for biofuels that have low carbon intensity scores. That ship sailed, and there are many groups that supported that out in farm country, that legislation. So, you know, part of what Senate Bill 201 does is, is say, okay, well, if if a carbon, if this carbon company decides it's at a point uh, in its business plan that it's going to start taking that federal tax credit, it needs to really profit share with both landowners and affected landowners and those affected counties that the pipeline's running through. So that's another good example. There are other requirements uh, such as the depth of the, that the pipeline needs to be buried in South Dakota. I believe, please don't quote me, but I believe it's a foot deeper than uh, the federal requirement for that pipeline, you know, kind of safety measure. Um, I always mess up what the footage actually is, but I really, I, Pretty sure it's a foot deeper. And then uh, another good example would be, you know, there's requirements for, you know, for dam certain damages that there be some indemnification. Um, that's a good smattering, I think, of, of part of what Senate Bill 201 brings to the table. So is this pipeline being treated differently than maybe other uh, projects, let's say like maybe a wind farm project or maybe a big giant solar project or something. Does it have different hoops that it has to jump through? That is another great question. And while I do not pretend to be an expert on the PUC's permitting process here in South Dakota, uh, really, to my understanding, that, you know, that decision that gets made by the regulatory body here, our, our, our state PUC, looks at the same kind of information, um, both for CO2 pipelines as it does for other multi-county projects. Okay, let's talk about this then. What does that mean if you get a yes vote? What does that mean for the 
potential of getting a CO2 pipeline to come through South Dakota? Because from what I understand, it's kind of a done deal, isn't it, in neighboring states? I think that all states are in slightly different spots when it comes to their regulatory process. But a yes vote, and, and I think this is another wonderful question that you asked. There has been kind of the perception that a yes or a no vote, either either, are going to stop this project from coming to South Dakota. When in reality, this, you know, I believe last week, uh, the pipeline company in question clearly indicated in a public manner that they are going to go ahead and apply for their permit or their license. I apologize. I can't remember which technically it is with the PUC. They're going to get their regulatory, they're going to apply for their regulatory approval from our state governing body on this, um, regardless of what happens with 201. So that's another myth, I think, that's kind of out there that this will, you know, that that voting no or yes, to be fair and really candid on 201, will stop or impact this project. Now, in South Dakota, from what I can gather, and I'm kind of an outsider looking in here, uh, it, it seems like it's it's mainly an argument of maybe pitting one county against the neighboring county and having the ability to prevent a certain county from taking part in this project. Is that kind of, is that right in any way? I, I think that's a great way to characterize uh, that county question, Marlon. And you've hit the nail on the head on one of the the real questions, one of the fair questions that I think uh, are is in front of voters. Listen, I think Senate Bill 201 makes, you know, there's been some misperceptions again on what what is in Senate Bill 201 when it comes to that question of County A versus County B, right? I'll use the perhaps not great example, but an example I think that resonates out in farm country of, you know, when Berkeley County, for instance, in California says that their farmers or their producers can't use glyphosate anymore, right? That affects those farmers and producers in that county. And hey, we would argue that's not great. But those farmers and producers actually right? They have representation in Berkeley County. They can vote for or against their county commissioners. Here, when you have a project with County A, let, let's say, that has issues and has passed perhaps a, a poison pill uh, ordinance to, to try and stop uh, the pipeline versus County B, as you mentioned, who is interested in participating, this isn't so much just a question of, okay, can County A make decisions that affects County A? You know, I don't think you know, that we, we're not, we're, that's just not the question in front of us. It's the fairer question is, okay, not only is there a question of what County A can do regarding its own property and its its citizens and its decisions, but does it impact County B? And because this is across counties uh, and across the state, you that answer is yes. So I don't know, you know, at some point, and believe me, corn farmers in South Dakota have struggled with this at times, but we've, you know, at some point you have to put your trust in a regulatory body, right? And you kind of have to live with that decision. Here for us, it's the PUC in South Dakota. Now we can have a different conversation, I suppose, about whether folks think the PUC is at ad has adequate decision-making ability and funding and the expertise to, to make these decisions. But at the end of the day, that's that's the regulatory body that's been tasked with this decision. I think there's a myth, another myth that 201 really is a get out of jail free card for both the PUC and for folks who, and for, well, frankly, either the proponents of the pipeline or more specifically for the pipeline company that wants to end up being here in South Dakota. And that isn't true. You know, the question of what needs to come in front of the PUC and what needs to be considered remains and has actually been strengthened in Senate Bill 201. It doesn't say that the PUC may look at information that comes from these local jurisdictions. It says they shall. So if the PUC receives information that's credible from counties or local governments that they have to consider that and they have to consider that on the record. 201 says it has to, and we think that's a good thing. What, to be totally candid with your listeners, the intent of 201 though does touch upon is, hey, it doesn't want the PUC wasting its time 
with just poison pills, things that are not really real questions of safety or real questions of what is a county doing within the bounds of good decision making, but perhaps an ordinance that's been passed with only one goal in mind, and it's pretty plain. So again, I think there's been a little misperception about a, again, get out of jail free card. That doesn't exist for anybody. I am also glad I'm not on the PUC (laughs) and not on the ballot to be on the PUC. Coincidentally, some of those names are. We'll see how that all works. But again, I mean, that's part of the process, right, in the system. You have a regulatory body here that's charged with making a decision. And the intent of 201 is to say, hey, we want them to spend their time on real credible information that comes up from these local governments and not poison pills. And that that is... That is the truth as as we see it. It's not that there's, um, again, absolutely no impact from 201 when it comes to, to counties. It's just the intent, you know, to what degree is 201 impacting that information flow and what kind of information is it impacting? Okay, so we talked about the initiative at the state level and now the county levels. What about the individual landowner? So let's say... If this passes, does anything change for the rights of an individual corn farmer, let's say, and they want to bring a pipeline across his country and or his uh, his land on his private property, and he says, "I don't want that." Does he get overruled? Does he have any latitude there? That's another great question that does impact a little bit that question of eminent domain. Remember, these are two separate, you know, Senate Bill 201 and eminent domain, very different, different authorities. So on the question of whether there's an impact on that landowner's rights under eminent domain, the answer is no. Um, When it comes to other pieces of requirements, let's say, that are affected or mentioned in Senate Bill 201, I would have to go back and look specifically, but a very good example. Uh, Senate Bill 201, by reference, included a couple other House bills that included, I believe one of them included, as an example, a $500 payment, right? And the type of notice um, that a landowner is is has a right to if there, someone's going to do a survey on their land. Um, Now, to be clear, those bills are still law, even if Senate Bill 201 disappears tomorrow or I guess next uh, next next Tuesday. So it's a complex answer. There are still things that exist for landowners, regardless of 201. But I think, you know, some of that was the drafters and, you know, listen, sausage can be a little ugly to get made. I could things have been a little cleaner and not be, have been done by reference. Sure. But when I think of things that are available for landowners, um, I do think of, for instance, that notice requirement and that $500, but that, that will survive uh, regardless of what happens next Tuesday. You bring up a, a great point. And I, I love your example, the way you, you said that, because it is a whole separate issue here with the eminent domain just sitting over here and it's already existing law, right? Yes. This, exactly. Like you say, this does not change it in any way. So if someone has an issue with the way eminent domain is handled, that needs to be addressed separately, right? Uh, yeah. And, and, and we fully and a totally different deal, right? Probably will be at some point. Thank you so much for explaining that. Now let's, let's talk about election day. They have the vote on this. Yes or no. Uh, if it's no, nothing changes, right? If it's yes, what happens next? Well, a yes vote would mean that I believe the implementation date for Senate Bill 201 would be this upcoming July 1. I think that's the implementation date just for most South Dakota laws. So we would see Senate Bill 201 um, go into effect uh, as um Summit applies for their their PUC permit or you know what whatever it's called um, li- uh, license to operate. You know I don't think you'd see a ton of impact initially. I think that impact again starts to come when, for instance, uh, you have you know that pipeline company taking its its a portion anyhow of its projected seven billion dollars over ten years of of federal tax credit. So. Um, I don't know when they would that company would start to make those types of um, uh, claims to the IRS, but at least the law would be there that allowed for the um, for for that profit sharing to occur. And let's let's be clear, this would apply beyond just this one project. 
I mean, if other projects were proposed in the future, it would apply to them too, right? This law is specific to carbon pipelines. And yes, it would technically apply to future to future projects. You know, that said, though, I think, you know, it's important to remember that the law can always, listen, we're all working on this. This is new ground for a lot of us. And if another carbon pipeline uh, company wants to come to South Dakota on a different project, I think the legislature is always able to assess, right, and stop and say, okay, what worked, what didn't work this last time. So technically, yes, um, I think this would cover other potential CO2 pipelines, but in reality, I think we can always make things better. Well, I'm glad you took time out to talk with us and explain how this very important issue is is uh, set up and the mechanics behind it. I appreciate that a lot. And I know farmers are on both sides of the issue. It can be a very divisive issue. I, I guess it doesn't really have to be. I, I think everybody just needs to be civil and sort this all out uh, for the better good of everybody. And uh, so we can move forward. Otherwise, nothing ever happens the way it seems. So I thought you did a great job. Thank you, Danita. It's a, a pleasure to have you on. And let's see what happens uh, on the election cycle coming up next week. Danita Murray is with us. She is the executive director of the South Dakota Corn Growers Association. And that's going to do it for this episode. Thanks again for joining us for producer Brianne Hendrickson. I'm Marlon Bowling. We'll catch you next time right here on the Comstock Channel. Futures trading involves risk. The risk of loss in trading futures and or options is substantial, and each investor and or trader must consider whether this is a suitable investment. Past performance is not indicative of future results.